Hello, this is Neil Hansen. I'm one of the radiologists at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I'm giving you a lecture here on ultrasound physics, part of a four lecture series. This one is entitled Basics of Ultrasound Concepts and Transducers. I have no disclosures. I am receiving no money for this. All this was uh, information was freely available via common sources, either online or in commonly used textbooks. For this talk, there are several questions. Uh, so you can log on to this website and you can sign in and do a quiz as part of my uh, tutorial today. If you just start it, take the survey. This will enable me to get information on where people need work in the future so I can improve my teaching in uh, certain areas. Uh, also, if you're one of my residents, I ask that you log in and take these quizzes and record your name uh, appropriately so I can ensure that it has been done. But here's the website for the quiz for the questions within this online lecture. All right. References that you can use for the material covered, the RSNA physics module, ultrasound concepts and transducers is the backbone of this. Also the Huda textbook, chapter 10, and the more comprehensive Bushberg textbook, chapter 14. Also, uh, if you're not a textbook person, there are several excellent online YouTube videos which are freely available, as well as this excellent radiology um, uh, article through radiographics. The radiographics did a series from the American Association of Physicists and Medicine on all sorts of physics topics, and this basic concepts and new technology and ultrasound is an oldie, but it's a goodie. It's very well uh, done and comprehensive, so feel free to use that as a backup reference. Ultrasound is unique. It has a couple unique features. One is that it has no significant biological effects at the typically used diagnostic parameters. It allows for imaging in real time, so you can use it for things like needle guidance during procedures, and you can essentially get any plane, any orientation. You're not stuck with coronal, sagittal, axial. You can do uh, funky oblique things, and you can do things like in interventional radiology, guiding needles underneath ribs or around structures that you can't really avoid with CT guidance. So it's a very versatile tool. It's also becoming increasingly smaller and smaller to the point where even clinicians can use uh, ultrasound at the bedside uh, or in the emergency room suite uh, and various other locations. I honestly think ultrasound will probably be the stethoscope of the next uh, couple decades. It's very portable, it's relatively cheap, and you can get some quantitative capabilities with Doppler ultrasound especially. Here's the first quiz question. And so after every quiz question, you'll get that little song played, allowing you to answer online on your survey. However, if you'd rather um, pause it and take some longer time, I will uh, obviously you can do that option. So in ultrasound, the physical quantity varying with time is, the correct answer is in fact pressure. Pressure is the correct answer. So the correct answer was in fact pressure. So acoustics, a little bit about the basics of uh, acoustics. Sound waves are really just a pressure disturbance propagating through a medium. Any material or virtually any material can propagate sound waves, although different materials propagate them to different advantages. For example, if we're doing an ultrasound of the liver, the sound wave is essentially just getting propagated through the liver parenchyma. Changes in pressure are instigated by an outside force. When we do a medical ultrasound, that outside force is generated by the sonographic transducer. You have to know some basics uh, about the physics of how sound moves through tissues. And a couple things to know about are the amplitude. The amplitude on this graph you can see here goes from the baseline to the maximum pressure disturbance. It's just the size of the difference from the equilibrium state in terms of that pressure disturbance. The larger the amplitude, the higher the intensity of the sound. There's wavelength and frequency, which are probably the two most commonly um, discussed things in terms of sonographic physics. Uh, wavelength is just the distance between wave crests. 
frequency is the number of crests or oscillations per second. So it's pretty intuitive if you have a wave with more crests per second, it's going to have a shorter wavelength. This distance is called the amplitude again from the baseline to the maximum pressure disturbance. This distance is the wavelength which disturbs the frequency. The anatomy of a sound wave. So the wave of propagation comes from the uh, transducer in sonography. It's going from the transducer out and then we listen for the echoes coming back. There are areas of relatively low pressure which we call rare fractions and then there are areas of relatively higher pressure which causes the wave to compress together. Ultrasound waves are longitudinal waves of altering compression and rarefaction. Uh, so basically rarefaction at its uh, core is just something that's getting less dense and compression is something that is getting more dense. Again, this just kind of takes you through a lot of these basic concepts of wavelength, frequency, minimum pressure, amplitude being the pressure disturbance above the baseline. Ultrasound waves travel at a given velocity and frequency. The frequency is usually measured in hertz. One hertz is one oscillation per second. Uh, when we're talking about hearing, it's oftentimes in uh, the kilohertz range, so thousands of oscillations per second. The period is just the time between the oscillations, so you can mathematically drive that as one over the frequency. If you look at the hearing range of humans, it's around 20, or 20 to 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. Uh, different animals, especially ones that use echolocation like the beluga whale or bats can hear in a much higher um, range than humans can. If you uh, are a math person and you like to think of this in terms of equations, uh, just think about the example of 10 hertz that has a period of 0.1 because it's 1 divided by 10, which is 10 cycles per second or 0.1 seconds per period. Uh, most of the things that humans hear is 15 to 20,000 hertz or 15 to 20 kilohertz. Here's our friend the dolphin, which can hear much more than that. All right, transducers. Most clinical transducers are in the 1 to 20 megahertz range. Different clinical applications call for different frequencies and thus different transducers. We'll go through that a little bit, but in the meantime, why don't you answer this question? The velocity of a 3 megahertz sound beam is slowest in. The correct answer is air. Sound actually travels relatively poorly in air because the molecules are so spaced far apart. All right, wavelength. So the wavelength of a sound at a given frequency depends on the compressibility of the material it's going through. Here's an example of a low frequency wave and a high frequency wave. Obviously the low frequency wave is going to have a long wavelength versus a short wavelength for the high frequency wave. In general, wavelength decreases with increasing frequency. So at 4 megahertz, the wavelength is going to be 0.39 millimeters versus at 10 megahertz, that's a much higher frequency, the wavelength is going to be shorter at 0.15 millimeters. We have more concepts. Again, this is a lecture about just the basic concepts of sonography and ultrasound in general. So the speed of sound. So if you go back to like high school physics, velocity equals the frequency times the wavelength, which is in meters per second squared. Sound velocity in any given material is constant and it's independent of the frequency. This is a very important concept. So the speed of sound is determined by whatever you're going through. It doesn't matter what the frequency is. So velocity is inversely proportional to the square root of the material compressibility. So this is an inverse relationship and so that's why there's such a drastic change in these velocities. For those of you listening at home, I just had a major fight with my daughter because she went and played her piano exactly when I told her not to play her piano. Uh, the one time of the day that I told her she couldn't do it is when I was recording this lecture and she just did it. So whatever. Uh, carry on. So again, velocity is inversely proportional to the square root of the material compressibility. Compressible materials like air have low velocities, while non-compressible materials like bone have very high velocities. 
So what's the velocity of sound in soft tissue? This is a number for the radiology physics boards that I'd commit to memory. The correct answer is 1540 meters per second. So not all of our soft tissue is actually, you know, soft tissue density, especially when you consider fat. So sound moves through fat a little bit slower than other soft tissues, and that causes an artifact, which is displacement artifact. All right. I like this illustration here because it really shows um, the, uh, the concept of speed going through different tissues at different uh, speeds. Uh, this is a... a uh, illustration from that radiographics article that was cited uh, earlier in the talk. Uh, and it's an excellent article online about ultrasound artifacts. All right, so imagine there that the darker arrow uh, travels through a focal fat in the liver. So let's say there's a big glob of focal fat, say right here. Because the trip to the diaphragm and back will take longer than just traveling through the liver, because functionally, if you go through a glob of fat, the speed's gonna slow down. Then the ultrasound machine places it farther away than it really is, the echoes that are deep to it in terms of um, how a sonographic machine assigns where the echo is coming from depends on how fast it returned. And so if you delay its return, it's going to think it's farther away than it really is. And so hence, there's this displacement artifact along the diaphragm. Here's the density and speed of ultrasound for various tissues. Again, you have materials that are not very dense, like air, and it travels really slowly, versus in bone, which is very dense, it actually travels very fast. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that because there's something called acoustic impedance, which we'll get into also. Obviously, uh, you know, it's not easy to hear people through very super dense material, and that has to do with other properties, which we'll discuss later. Another concept for the basics of sound. Yes, there is. It's called intensity. Intensity is the measure of energy flowing through a given cross-sectional area each second, and it's measured in megawatts per centimeter squared. The total power of a sonographic beam is the intensity of the beam times the area over which it's exposed, and then you can calculate the total energy, which is power times time. That's the time the beam is on find a lot of radiologists don't know a lot about this because at a diagnostic range, we're not using any powers or energies that are dangerous, although there's several theoretical or I guess in development research applications for treating tumors or even fibroids or things like that, which use uh, powers and energies that do desiccate tissues. So we should be aware of them. Intensity is measured in decibels. You can see here up to 140 decibels, a shotgun blast by your ear, or loud, you know, 70 decibels, car alarm, city traffic. Once you get up to 200 decibels, you're talking about my kids uh, or myself yelling recently at Lizzie when she was playing the piano. That's what Jack thinks of it, uh, my youngest son. That's uh, He's letting you know just what he thinks. All right, decibels. Negative decibels, that means sound is being attenuated. Positive decibels, that means sound is being amplified. It's a logarithmic scale. So if you reduce a sound to 10%, that's minus 10 decibels. If you reduce it to 1%, that's minus 20 decibels and so on. So it's logarithmic. If you increase a thousand times, uh, that's 30 decibels. And if you've ever had a really fancy home sound machine, you know that's why it's kind of hard to find the sweet spot for what your movie should be played at because this logarithmic scale can lead to really sudden changes in volume uh, that are really quite drastic. Uh, if you double the um, sound, uh, that's about three decibels on this scale. All right, another concept. Acoustic impedance. So acoustic impedance, or Z, of a material is the density of the material times the sound velocity, and it results in another unit, which you have to know about, which is called the Rayel. Here's the relative impedance of different materials. For example, the piezoelectric crystal with which most sonographic transducers create and receive the sound waves has a very high acoustic impedance, as does bone, versus things like air and fat really have a much lower acoustic impedance. 
This acoustic impedance is independent of the frequency of the diagnostic range, so it's material dependent. It doesn't depend on the frequency you're using. Air, which is low velocity and low density, has a low impedance. Bone has a high impedance. So that's why the differential, uh, even though sound is faster in bone than it is in air, that's why there's a differential ability to, he to hear on the other side of that given barrier. It's because of the impedance of the inherent uh, material that you're going through. Differences in acoustic impedances at interfaces determine the amount of energy which is reflected. This is what I call a wake up moment. So if you weren't paying attention on that last slide, wake up. All right, correct answer is bone. So hopefully you put down bone. Ultrasound, wave interactions. So reflection. So a wave can go out and then come straight back. That's called the reflection or some people call it an echo. These reflections are not simple. They can be either non-specular, which uh, non-specular reflection is scatter, usually from a rough surface with a contour that's bigger than the wavelength of the sound beam, or they can be specular, which tends to happen with large, smoother surfaces. Sound that gets reflected back is called an echo, and the key is that echoes are used to make the ultrasound images. When sound goes back, it can, uh, or sound when it goes out, can become attenuated, or just kind of uh, absorbed by the soft tissues that it's traveling through. It can be reflected back. It can be scattered all around, especially things with microscopic jagged edges. It can be refracted, which is just a fancy physics way for saying bent, or can be diffracted. Here's an example of a specular versus a uh, non-specular um, reflector. So in a specular reflector, the incident waves goes in, comes back, versus in a non-specular reflector, it comes in and it gets scattered about in all sorts of different directions. Here's another fancy uh, way of kind of showing a mirror, a specular reflector versus just diffused reflection on a jagged surface. Reflection is the amount of ultrasound reflected, um, and it depends on the acoustic impedance of the tissues and the type of the interface. So, for example, a tissue air interface reflects sound uh, almost in its entirety, and that's why you have to use ultrasound gel, because if you didn't, that soft tissue gas interface would literally reflect all of the sound. And in fact, when you're looking in the abdomen on an abdominal ultrasound, if you have a real gassy person, uh, or for example, if you have a bunch of gas in the pylorus, you may not be able to see the head of the pancreas. So that actually uh, is a concept that proves clinically relevant sometimes. The more reflection, the brighter it is on our screen. So if you have bowel filled with gas, it's going to cause echogenic shadowing behind it. It's going to look really bright and uh, you're not going to be able to make out anything deep to it. I, yes, this is true. Ultrasound gel. What is ultrasound gel used for? It's used to minimize large reflection at the skin air interface. Shadowing. So in general, sound can't really travel through bone or air that well. For example, we at least current with current technology, we can't use an ultrasound transducer, shoot it across the room and tell if someone's you know liver has a tumor. Um, so the lack of transmission results in a shadow. So here's a shadow related to a gallstone here in this picture that you can see. All right, wave interactions. So not only do we have to know about the different um, properties of the wave, but we have to know how it interacts with tissue around it. So if an object is, small, is smaller than the wavelength, uh, for example, you know, little microscopic edges on a calcification in the kidney, then scattering occurs. Uh, and each inherent tissue in your body is composed of unique scattering sites or scattering signatures, which account for their relative acoustic signature, i.e. the way they look on an ultrasound. By definition, hyperechoic is a higher scatter amplitude relative to background. Uh, that's why if you look at a kidney stone, it's hyperechoic or echogenic. Uh, it can be the result of more scatters, larger, larger scatters, or just differences in acoustic impedance uh, at the local environment level. 
Here's an example of a liver full of different uh, echogenic masses or metastasis in this case, which is in the highlighting that principle. There's just a difference in the acoustic signature of the tumor and the background liver parenchyma allowing you to see it. Hypoechoic. So hypoechoic is a relatively less or lower acoustic scatter rel relative to the background around it. So for example, fluid has no internal structure and it transmits waves rather well. Um, uh, so it transmits a wave rather than creating an echo and it uses hypoechoic or even if it's pure fluid, it may look anechoic, which is totally black. For example, in this kidney cyst. Refraction. So refraction is the change in direction of an ultrasound beam when going from one tissue to another with a different speed of sound. The frequency remains the same, but the wavelength changes. I want to reiterate that. The frequency remains the same, but the wavelength will change when a sound wave is being refracted. If the sound in tissue 2 has a lower velocity, the wavelength is reduced. So it makes sense. The frequency has to stay the same. If you're at an interface with two different tissues and they propagate sound differently, the only thing left to change is the wavelength, which will change. And it does this according to Snell's law. Again, if you're a mathematically inclined person, you can calculate this out using things called sines and cosines. You know, that stuff that you used to have to do in calculus, which really, I'll be honest, is uh, not important for being a diagnostic radiologist. <clears throat> Refraction. So if velocity of sound in tissue two is greater, then the angle increases and vice versa. Ultrasound machines assume everything is in a straight line. So if you have a tissue interface that is causing refractions, it's going to cause an artifact. If you really are bad at ultrasound guided procedures and your needle isn't going where it is, just tell your attending, hey, I think there was some refraction going on. That's why I couldn't stick that tumor for the biopsy. All right, ultrasound wave interactions, attenuation. Attenuation is just the loss of sound by absorption and scatter. Absorbed sound turns to heat. Little absorption occurs in fluids. Ultrasound attenuation is an exponential process. It's expressed in terms of decibels. Again, attenuation increases with increasing frequency, and therefore high-frequency probes don't penetrate much. So attenuation increases with frequency. High-frequency probes are great for seeing structures that are just deep to the skin surface, very superficial things like the thyroid gland. However, you can't use them to image like the pancreas or things deep in the liver because they attenuate out and because of that lack of penetration, you really can't see deep structures. An ultrasound beam traveling through a normal liver is least likely to be amplified. There's almost nothing in the body that really significantly amplifies sound. So now that we know a little bit about the basics of the physics of a sound wave, we have to discuss the machine. Uh, the ultrasound machine is a transducer. It converts one form of energy to another. It's a piezoelectric transducer. So that literally means taking pressure and turning it into electricity or taking electricity and turning it into pressure. This is usually done by a fancy crystal that can create ultrasonographic waves. PZT, pressure electricity. And we have all sorts of different transducers. You can have a sector transducer where there's a single point emanating out into an array. You can have a linear array with like 96 points and you can have a curved array with multiple points that are slightly off angle. We use these for all sorts of different concepts and practical applications within imaging the body. So a piezoelectric element, which you can think of that's the basic functional part of a transducer, is uh, vibrates to generate a sound wave when a voltage is applied. The piezoelectric element generates a voltage when a vibration is applied. So the same basic concepts are used to send out the sound wave and to listen to the echo coming back. And then through a bunch of computer magic, those generated electrical impulses are used to make an image on a screen. Crystals. So these piezoelectric crystals are coated with a silver that functions as an electrode. And that electricity causes the crystal, when applied, to expand and create contract, which creates that pressure front in front of the transducer, which eventually leads out to the sonographic wave going into the patient. There's uh, more complex components to that. You have 
damping materials, you have gel at that uh, air body interface, uh, etc. Interestingly, you can also use a piezoelectric uh, cigarette lighter uh, for a spud gun to create pressure and shoot a potato, uh, for example, I don't know, into your neighbor's house. Crystal. So the crystal is used to send the sound and then to receive it. And the returning echoes create a voltage in the crystal. And again, via computer magic, an image is formed. Most transducers operate in something called pulse mode. So that's where it's, uh, you know, intermittently sending a wave out and listening, send it out and listen, send it out and listen, you know, on, off, on, off, on, off. Changing the thickness of an ultrasound crystal changes which of the following? Correct answer is the frequency. So crystals, so the thickness of the crystal determines the frequency of the transducer. You can calculate this by the thickness being about half the wavelength. So the high frequency transducers are thin and the low frequency transducers are thick. Uh, transducer basics, again, you have these things like dampening layers, matching layers, you have a power supply, obviously, and backing materials. Most transducers have a range of frequencies they are able to produce, so that's known as the transducer bandwidth. The narrower the bandwidth, the purer the frequency, the last, lo longer it will last in general. So like when you go to buy an ultrasound machine, uh, you know, the sales rep will talk about how narrow or how perfect the bandwidth is for a given frequency, for example. Short-term memory check. I said this just about five minutes ago. So thyroid ultrasound is done with a linear high-frequency transducer. High-frequency works really great for things that are superficial, like the thyroid gland. Transducer design. So most are broadband with short pulses, damping materials behind a crystal to reduce vibration, and then that matching layer in front of the transducer impedances in between that of the transducer and the tissue, so that kind of improves the efficiency of the energy transmission. That's all kind of basic engineering stuff, which quite honestly I don't understand that much. Transducer design arrays. So one beam is a single line of sight, one line in an ultrasound image. Most transducers are multi-element arrays, so they can be linear or they can be a phased array. So linear, phased, different applications. Linear usually has 128 to 256 elements. Each of these fires and then receives signals in succession. A phased array transducer, like a transvaginal probe, would be an example of this potentially. 96 elements, all of them are used simultaneously uh, with all of the rays originating from a single point. Here's a linear transducer. It's simpler. It's electronically more simple. It has a rectangular field of view and it's got great resolution in the near field. You can use it for the thyroid gland. You can use it for looking at the carotid artery for stenosis because that's very superficial. You can look at the IJ. You can use it to guide needle access into the IJ. It's good for things in musculoskeletal imaging if you're looking at like the supraspinatus tendon or in pediatric imaging if you just have a small thin person. Uh, it's good for vascular work like the carotids. Here's a phased array transducer. It's got a smaller probe that will fit in smaller acoustic windows, like between ribs. It's got great penetration for things that are deep in the abdomen or pelvis. This small superficial field of view has very poor imaging in the near field, however, so you wouldn't want to use it for the aforementioned applications like you would want to use the high-frequency linear transducer for. Abdominal imaging. We generally use a 1 to 6 megahertz often curvilinear transducer. It's got a wide field of view. It's got a good balance between penetration and resolution and for things like scanning the liver for a tumor or seeing the kidney and looking for hydronephrosis, this general five megahertz curvilinear transducer is the most commonly employed tool. Peripheral imaging, again, you're gonna do a higher frequency linear transducer. You can push that five megahertz up to like 12, 13 megahertz, trying to look at things like supraspinatus tendons. It's got higher resolution with poor penetration. The extreme example of a linear high frequency transducer would be the hockey stick. So the hockey stick 
uh, is good for things that are very superficial. So like if you're trying to look at the brachial plexus of an infant, or if you're trying to look at like tendons in a finger, stuff like that, that's when you break out the hockey stick. What is the value of an endoluminal transducer? Well, no, it's not just fun to play with at home by yourself. It is used for decreasing attenuation and scatter. If you think of the example of like the prostate gland and using an endorectal probe to look at the prostate gland, you can eliminate all the attenuation and scatter that happens in the subcutaneous fat and superficial top, soft tissues because if you go transrectally, you can get the transducer essentially almost immediately up against the prostate gland. The same thing is true about transvaginal scanning and looking at an ovary. If you can get up close to the organ of interest, you're going to eliminate attenuation and scatter and have a much better image. Endorectal, we use that for the prostate, endovaginal, uterus and ovaries, sometimes the appendix. We can see it endovaginally. Uh, you know, a transesophageal echo looking at the heart is the same concept. It's in close proximity to the organ of interest, it improves image quality, and it prevents attenuation and scatter. Echocardiography, uh, so obviously this is in the cardiology realm, not really in the radiology realm, but they generally used phase array, small foot trans small footprint transducers and transesophageal endoluminal probes to get close, especially for valve evaluation. There are also three and 4D probes. Usually this is used for obstetrics in the mall where you can pay money to have a picture of your baby, like this one of my baby. Um, but, uh, you know, it's also useful clinically. Uh, for example, they may use this a lot in like a high risk OB clinic, uh, looking at maxillofacial deformities, cleft lips, cleft palates, complex anomalies like that. 3D imaging can really be beneficial. And you can have a happy baby. You can have a Buddha baby. You can have, hey, stop bothering me. I'm all crowded in here. You can have a nice baby or you can have someone like my son. All right. Thank you for paying attention for this lecture. I hope it was helpful and I hope you have a good day.